Welcome everybody to the latest meeting of the IR US community. And today we're really excited to have our guests, Elizabeth Castillo. And Elizabeth has been working uh, with us on some ideas to try and, and identify uh, and classify the, the diversity of the US integrated reporting system. So welcome, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to let you just take it from here. And then uh, after, after the presentation, then we'll open it up for questions. OK, great. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Castillo. I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University. And I've been working with Mary and Bob and Sean Steinsmith on um, creating a database of what the uh, reporting looks like in the United States to see who is using integrated reporting. And so we came up with the idea uh, to have my class work as um, some horsepower on this project. And that's what we're going to be talking about is what their findings were on their analysis of some uh, United States reports. Um, so for the context of the project, can you, everybody see my screen okay? Right. Okay. So for the context of the problem, or we wanted to develop a database to see what's going on with reporting in the United States. And part of our goal is our long game plan is to increase awareness of integrated reporting. Um, a first step is just to see, well, what are companies doing in terms of integrated reporting? And we hope by through this process that this could um, illuminate a path for others to follow and take up uh, integrated reporting, similar to what Intel was doing in the last webinar. Um, and then from uh, people who use the database, as well as you all, and we're looking for feedback to uh, continuously improve the database. And we'll be talking about that uh, a bit more at the end of this session. So our initial uh, approach was to come up with some criteria. What should be in the database? What markers are we looking for? And uh, I'll go into that in the presentation. Um, then we used my class, which was run uh, the last, uh, like in April and May, uh, to beta test the database uh, and populate it by um, doing content analysis of some annual reports. And I'll show you which ones the students chose. And then today and going forward, we'll be looking uh, to refine the criteria. What else should be in the database? Is there anything that we're missing or is it uh, too much? Because we want it to be user friendly. And then with the idea of eventually scaling the database so we can target it for different types of sectors, um, large, small, family owned, public or, uh, agencies, nonprofit organizations. Um, and then see how we might categorize that and make it more uh, usable and researchable. So the design criteria we used for the database is we wanted it to be simple, intuitive, and easy to understand. So, and I'll go through one of the sample uh, criteria. And we um, kind of mapped out where stu uh, organizations were on the journey. So we use a rating of one to four to see how one is that they're not doing anything towards integrated reporting, Four is they're using complete integrated reporting according to the IIRC uh, framework, including the connectivity materiality. Uh, and then hopefully give them um, some ideas or companies ideas of how to get there and how to move from one to four. Um, and so the categories of how we determined whether somebody was between one and four is we looked at um, four different things. One, the types of capitals they're talking about. So are they, everybody will of course be talking about financial, but what other of the other five are they talking about? Uh, second, are they talking about just narrative, like a narrative format describing what their human resources are, or do they have metrics uh, that they're using to, to quantify some of those resources? And then a best practice is they would ideally be tracking these over multiple years to use multi-year metrics. Um, a third thing we are looking for is connectivity. So are they, is, are they demonstrating integrated thinking where they show the strategy behind the resource inputs and how these get transformed through their business model and their business processes into outputs, outcomes, and impact. Uh, so, and then are they talking about the framework? So that would include like externalities, materiality, uh, and risk. So the seven principles and eight content elements of the IIRC framework. So based on that, we came up with scoring criteria. So one is basically a minimum of three because we knew everybody would be talking about financial and manufactured since that's in the conventional accounting anyways. Uh, and then uh, narrative 
format. So that's that's basic. That's the, the lowest bar. Then if they talk about four uh, and if they talk about positive and negative externalities, uh, and then do they also add some visualization? Um, as we saw in the Intel report, they've done a really good job showing their value creation process and how the inputs are transformed. Um, three, uh, to score a three, they would need to have a minimum of five capitals and then be talking uh, of in, in language like connectivity, inputs, outputs, uh, and then maybe still only tracking single year metrics. And then four would be the best practice of using all six of the capitals and, and talking about them in that language, citing the IIRC framework and tracking the resources over multi-year metrics. Uh, so here's an example of what the database looks like. Um, it's the, the database. And so Mary had um, got this going and done some sa sample reports like Clorox. And so I gave my students that database and then just had them start filling it in with their company. So this is one that somebody did for Starbucks. Um, so, it, you know, most of the co companies they chose, as you'll see, were, are publicly traded because that's the goal of the project is, uh, for, in it, for the beta version. Um, and then we gave them what type of industry, and I gave them something from the um, Commerce Department to, to help them categorize what year of the report, what the functional title of the report was, and then did it have a theme, like a catchy branding theme. Um, where it was located on the uh, website of the company, does it come in hard copy and uh, electronic, or what, what forms does it come in? How long is it, the number of pages? Um, how does it talk about stakeholders? So does it re reference them specifically, or does it talk more in general terms like the public? Uh, what kind of standards the report adheres to? So most of them will be the GAP um, the standards, um, who was the assurance provider? In this case, Deloitte and Touche did their um, the audit. Uh, the value creation, do they talk about it in terms of narrative or narrative and graphics? Um, and then getting to the capitals specifically, are they using the capitals vocabulary about multiple capitals? In this case, Starbucks does not use that language. Um, how are they tracking the financial and manufactured multi-year in this case? Uh, intellectual capital, they reference it, but they did not talk about it um, in, um, numerically. Uh, and then human capital, relationship capital, and natural capital. And then in, uh, as companies move tor towards integrated reporting, did they use a multiple capital scorecard? In this case, it was not applicable because they're nowhere near that. Uh, where it was the source for the report and then what was the overall rating. So in this case, uh, Starbucks earned a 1.5 because they did um, talk about more than uh, a couple, three forms of capitals, but they did not do any visualization uh, or robustly regarding their value creation process, for example. And I'll be giving you specific examples uh, from, from their report in a little bit. Um, so to give you some context for the, the uh, course that we ran, it was an undergraduate course, uh, OGL 260 resource allocation. And this was formally, uh, formerly then totally from a financial capital perspective uh, with stakeholder or shareholders as the main emphasis. So what I did this spring is I transitioned the course to a multiple capitals format. Uh, where I talked about multiple forms of resources, and we did one category. It's a seven and a half week online course. So um, each week we covered one of the categories of capitals. Um, I had 23 students, um, and we throughout the course, throughout, throughout all seven of the modules, we talked about connectivity, materiality, risk, um, coupling, how, how resources are coupled together to create um, value is one thing. And then the final project, which is what I'll be talking about today, is their analysis of the annual report. And then some of the intermediary assignments also had them look at their chosen annual report uh, to talk about like social capital, for example. Um. So the companies that they reviewed are listed on this page. And um, I, Mary and I kind of toyed around with, well, should we let them pick them out or should I inform that? So I gave them uh, freedom within limits is sort of my parenting and uh, teaching mantra. Um, I gave them uh, what 
we were what we're looking for most of them stuck to that but pedagogically it's just much um, better to let students have some choice in the projects they work on because then their hearts more in it um, and I would have to say that the applied nature of this project they knew that this was going to go into a database and that this was going to um, be seen by other people it really motivated them I think to get excited about the project and do their best work so pedagogically that worked really well too um, so the companies that they looked at um, Amazon Amtrak, uh, two of the students chose Apple, uh, one student chose Arizona Department of Fish and Game because he aspires to work there. Um, bio, oh, the, and so in red font are the students who worked on their own companies, and I'll tell you about why that was good and bad in, in a uh, later. Um, Boise Cascade, uh, Brinker International, so one of our students owned stock in that company, so he was very interested. Um, and I'll tell you sort of how his, his mindset changed as we got uh, through the course. Uh, Disney, Ernst Young, John Deere, which I'll be talking about because they actually were one of the better reports in terms of actually getting into strategic thinking, even though they only nibbled at it. Um, most of the reports did not get to the point of integrated thinking at all. Um, Lulu Lemon, uh, Nike, two students did that. Paycom, Procter & Gamble, uh, two students did Starbucks. One was internal and one was external, so that was interesting. Uh, and then USAA, which was an internal student or an employee or, who, or a student who worked there. Um, so most of my students are older. Uh, they uh, have been in the workforce a while and they either um, are coming back to school because they hit a wall that they need a degree in order to get promoted within their companies or they're trying to make sense of what is all this nonsense going on at work and how can you know uh, understanding uh, resources help them make sense of it um, so now we'll get to the results of the the analysis um, the average score for the reports was 1.5 most of them talked about more than um, three forms of capitals but very few had visualization and no company scored above 2.5. Um, and mostly what was lacking was any talk about connectivity, um, meaningful talk about externalities. Um, they did have multi-year metrics for their financial and manufactured capital in all almost all cases. Um, they used narratives to discuss their human relationship and intellectual capital. Um, and I think one of the surprises for me, just looking over them, is how little natural capital was talked about. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's because it gets outsourced to their sustainability reports, that they're, they're separate. But I didn't go and dig into those reports, so I can't, that's my assumption. Um, but within the reports, uh, when I uh, searched for the word natural, nature, environment, it came up mostly in terms of either natural disasters, so framed in terms of risk, or environment, regulatory environment, and environmental regulations, and so more in terms of constraints, but not in terms of a resource about this is how we use it to create value. That, no, that discussion was missing. So now I'm just going to go through, uh, these are slides I pulled from a student who worked, she's not, she does not work at Starbucks, she, but she did the report at Starbucks. And so she said how they talked about four types of capitals. Um, one, financial capital. Um, and so they talk about their revenue, their total revenue, and their total assets. And then they also go and spend a lot of time talking about their manufactured capital, about what facilities they own, um, how they own their roasting facilities, but they lease their warehousing and distribution locations, as an example. Um, then the other two they talked about were, or specifically were um, human capital, although they don't call it human capital, they call it either human resources or partners sometimes. But Googling or uh, searching the word partners, most of it is reserved or for their strategic partners about who they work with in other um, cities and regulatory uh, companies or uh, companies they may be acquiring and there was a little very little talk about their own partners uh, uh, but there was some discussion of it so they say how many employees they employ and then how they invest in their employees so um, just some disclosures um, a lot of my students are Starbucks baristas ASU has a partnership with Starbucks uh, which is why I had a kind of higher expectations for this report because they're so avant-garde in many ways. Um, but when it comes to reporting, they, they're at 1.5. Uh, and so uh, they give good benefits to their employees and they do talk about that. 
uh, in their reports. And then in the intellectual capital, there's a narrative discussion of it. It's not quantified. And that's mostly in terms of um, trademarks and patents uh, and their copyrights for their packaging and promotion. Um, so, and then they talk about their relationship with their community and environment. And here again, I'm guessing that that's a deeper discussion in their sustainability report, which is separate. Uh, but they do talk about how they source their coffee, uh, their trees, uh, the, the trees and the impact on the coffee farmers, their lead certification for the energy and environmental design, um, be offering discounts to their customers for bringing a reusable um, cup, uh, and how they're uh, ethically sourcing their tea and cocoa as examples. And the student's conclusion was that they have done a fantastic job with their brand and their experience, um, which is built on the idea of quality and global rep uh, reputation and consistent customer experience and developing what they call the, the third place, that Starbucks is a, a place to build community but they don't talk about it in terms of relational capital or, and so the students saw this as a missed opportunity or I guess a future opportunity is that they really do have, they're doing things that could be framed in the multiple capitals framework. Um, and by using an IRC framework, they would uh, improve their capacity for integrated thinking um, and also developing multi-year metrics. Uh, and that gets to one of the downsides of, of the students. So after taking this course, um, it's sort of like they see capitals everywhere. And so they read into the reports, um, like so Starbucks building a third place. They, uh, they knew, oh, that's social capital. But, and so they ranked Starbucks a little higher than it should have been. And that's why I had to go in and kind of, um, and so in, when I do this next semester, I will be, uh, talking more specifically, if they don't use the language, you can't give them credit for it because they didn't talk about it with the capitals vocabulary. Um, so the, the results, the main takeaway of looking at all of the, the reports is that most of the focus in, in, in almost all the reports was on financial outcomes and risk identification. Uh, and I think the metaphor that comes to mind, I don't know if you all follow American football, but there's a, in the last two minutes, if you're winning the game, a lot of times a company will go into what's called prevent defense. Um, it's where you start focusing on risk, what it could the other team do. And the ironic thing is, is when you go into that risk prevent defense, you end up um, losing the game a lot of times. And so uh, John Madden said, a prevent de defense prevents you from winning. And it's sort of what popped into my mind about all this focus on risk and financial outcomes is if you're not shining a light on the intangible things that help you create value, are you um, so risk averse um, that you're focusing your shareholders' attention on the wrong thing? And I'll give you an example of a company that I think is going in the right direction here in a minute. But that was my impression. So much talk about risk and what could go wrong and then the, fight and the impact that would have on financial. Um, very few graphics, and um, given that a lot of these companies are so uh, brand oriented, like Starbucks and uh, Nike and Apple as examples, I was really disappointed uh, that their um, uh, reports were not a little bit jazzier. Um, and sort of like, and I guess part of this might have been seeing Intel's you know report where they're taking it uh, and what what's possible, uh, but these are all very text heavy uh, and um, not emotionally grabbing. And uh, there was very little to no discussion of connectivity, strategy, or, or innovation. So how do the resource investments um, they make promote these areas? And similarly about externalities or, how, or the value creation process of how do they turn the inputs into outputs. Um, so one outlier, which was surprising, I don't know, we have mental models of what companies are like, right? But John Deere, I think, was the um, company that did the best um, in the reports that I looked at to at least talk about, hey, this is how we're setting ourselves up for success in the future. And so they talked about innovation and their product design and their research and development. And so this was the closest that anybody came, A, to some visualization, even though they're not uh, value creating story visualization, um, but at least it's catchy and emotionally grabbing. And they talked about, you know, the difference that these innovations were going to have on their future val uh, capacity to create value. And so from a shareholder's perspective, I think this is super helpful. 
Um, so uh, the overarching conclusions, I think, are supporting Mike Cruz's analysis that it, the, the companies are, are doing things with multiple capitals. They talk about it in bits and pieces, but not in a connected way. Um, and with a little training and thinking, it would be pretty straightforward for them to create an integrated report. So it's, it's possible and doable. And uh, one thing that could help them, I think, is are these gap analysis, both in the integrated reporting about you know, how do you get from beginning integration to trailblazing integration. And so this is a very strategic roadmap for them to follow. And similarly, I think this is the, the big gap, is they talk very little about the, the thinking uh, behind it. And so this, I, I think, I see as the biggest challenge for them to weave into their integrated reporting, is how do you connect the front end, the resource inputs, into and tell the story of how you turn them into the, the outputs, outcomes, and impact. And um, a second uh, conclusion is I think the, the course, the students really enjoyed the course tremendously. Um, so I, the last, uh, one of their last assignments is a reflection. I'm gonna be sharing a couple of those with you in a minute. But um, I think this is a step towards what Beth Spurgeon was from Marcelo Mattal was mentioning in her May 9th webinar. Um, that it, uh, it's Maslow's law of the hammer. If all you have is a hammer, financial reporting, everything looks like a nail. So you're talking about efficiency and control and, and growth. Um, and by seeing that you actually have a bigger toolkit with these multiple kinds of capitals, it really changes how you, how you see the world. Um, and a couple of examples from, from my students. So one takeaway was that intangible resources are everywhere, but they're invisible unless you're looking for them. So one uh, student, he's a fire captain in Orange County, California, and he says, uh, we have many resources in our fire department that we do not take advantage of because we're always looking for tangible resources and intangible ones might be our biggest resource. So I think that was uh, one of the key takeaways. And then the, the second uh, framework, so the first framework was that, oh wow, I never knew we had all these resources at our disposal. Uh, the second one is, is some students, and these were usually a little bit the older students who had a lot of work experience, had a sense, yes, this makes sense intuitively. I knew that uh, relationships were important, but I never had a framework or a way to talk about it or a rationale to explain to people why I'm spending time building relationships with my peers. So IR provides a framework for what people know intuitively, and it, and it also illuminates a path for them to grow the resources. So one of our students, uh, he was a chief petty officer in the Navy, and Hawaii and um, he says I've increased my awareness at my command of human capital and how I can develop it by increasing intellectual and cultural capital and so seeing the coupled relationship between uh, and and that they're intermediary and, and ultimately that will get you to um, the, the long-term outcomes you're looking for let's see and so now this is where I think we'd like to open it up to is like what do you think about the database how could it be made most useful um, how can we help companies uh, start moving towards IR? Uh, one thing I was thinking as they start evolving is if we could also at some point add key performance indicators, because when I think about what are impediments to companies taking up integrated thinking, it's they don't know how to measure these intangibles. So if we could help them, and that's like the, um, the, the Sasol report that's so great about it, how it lays out its key performance indicators. And then also I think the database is going to have to be searchable, uh, so user-friendly in that way, and I don't know what format that might look like. Um, and then how can we get it populated? So Mary did a lot of work initially to, to do the base companies and uh, come up with the, the initial framework. And then um, I, my, I'll have 50 students in the fall who, would, who, who will do some more work on this, but to really make it take off, you know, could we work with the academic community or who do we need to get involved with this? And then how to publicize so that companies will start realizing, hey, I'm showing up in this database, maybe I wanna get, you know, this on my radar screen to up my game as an example. And I think that's what we're hoping as an opportunity. So, oh, that's it. Yeah, we'll go back. No, good. So, so um, we'll, we'll distribute the slides so people have them and, and I, I, um, please do connect with Elizabeth. So um, we'll, we can put that up again at the end, but uh, this is a great summary or an outline for us to open up to discussion because I'd love to uh, hear people's comments. I do want to just share or let Bob join in and, and um, 
mention that one of the things that, you know, the IRC has been very careful about not uh, rating um, or not, not approving or, or you know, um, validating reports. But we, we feel that, you know, to get interest in the U.S., we have to help people learn how to think about all these. So, um, Bob, I don't know if you want to chime in on that or just chime in in general before we open it up to discussion. Yeah, I can uh, chime in on that. Great, great presentation, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's been discussion in the IRC if we should be doing things like uh, ratings or giving an indication. And I think in the U.S. context, I think this is helpful because I think it shows the journey um, of what we're looking for of companies to go on. And it may not be, and it's very difficult in the U.S. to have people do an integrated report, but what Intel did in the 10K, or you can see all the different ways that companies are, are trying to communicate their story. And so I think it's just, um, we could say, here's our reflection of what we think. It's uh, in, in, you know, give data of how we, we come to our um, uh, our thought process, but I think it's healthy to, to, to kind of strive what we're looking for and what we believe uh, the company's path on. So there's, there's continuous discussion in the IARC and I'd welcome feedback on that. I think uh, I'm personally more for let's see what the state is and uh, give suggestions uh, of how people can improve on that. Elizabeth, I did have a question for you. Um, I was wondering if you can just give a background of this, o, I think it's OGL 260 course, of where it fits into um, uh, getting a degree um, and if it's elective or required, but more importantly, um, what maybe hoops you had to go through to really change the aspect of the course you indicated it was uh, focused on financial uh, reporting and um, financial capitals and uh, maybe convincing uh, your peers uh, and maybe how much flexibility you have in designing a course like this and what you had to go through. Uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on that. Oh, that's a great question, Bob. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, luckily, the ASU, what I love about working here is if you have a good idea, they will let you run with it. Um, so the uh, OGL 260 is a required course for every student who goes through our, our major. And we have about 5,000 students. Um, so that, as, as, so um, I'm hoping to get the other professors to, to take up this version of the class. The um, traditional version of the class, I don't know if you can see my screen, but it uses this Foundations of Finance book. And so that would be, I think, more, I don't even think that that's the right fit for our, most of our students. I mean, to the me, that's if you're going to go be a CFO, you're going to work for a company in finance, most of those people would be business or finance majors. Our students are mostly working professionals who are managers at an organization, but not in the finance portion of it. So they do need to understand budgets, project management, uh, resources, and how you create value. And so that's the shift I made in the course, is instead of just talking about uh, financial reporting and um, how you uh, look analyze uh, stocks and, and, and decide how to invest money to make the most money to start looking how does a business create value so we also talk about business models of uh, value creation they have to come up with a business uh, model template for their uh, their organization um, uh, the first week, we do talk about financial uh, accounting, and because I, I don't think anybody should graduate from college without being financially literate and being able to read a balance sheet. So they, the first week, we do financial reporting. They complete a balance sheet, by another financial statement, and then we, uh, so that they are at least familiar with that. Um, then the second week we go into social accounting. Well, what's not showing up on the balance sheet? Because one of their first uh, uh, introductions is what do you think a resource is? Uh, and so most of them talk about uh, money and then a few of them talk about time because for them that is sort of their most uh, valuable resource. Well, then they, in week two, they look back, oh, well, what's not showing up on the, the balance sheet? Time is not showing up on the balance sheet relationships. And, and so then they start to see, okay, that's why social accounting is important. And then we bring in the business model to show what are inputs that are needed to really be successful. Um, then in week three, we go to social capital relationships 
additional capital. And so it, by the end, they're starting to see, you know, they're, they're being, they become integrated thinkers in terms of business. But I also ask them to think about it in terms of their family life. You know, what does this have to do with their volunteer activities? Um, and so we try to, I, another pedagogical thing is to help them make meaning at multiple levels personally and, uh, and then in their own organizations. Does that answer your question, Bob? I take myself off mute. Yeah, sure does. Thank you. Okay, great. 